Hey, Jared. Hi. Long time no see. I know. I'd like to start off with a fairly complex scientific question. Are we completely fucked? <laughs> There have been, unfortunately, some serious harms already done. I was recently in Miami, and fish were swimming in the streets on a sunny day. Seawater comes up through the storm drains. The effects of the drought, the mistiming of rainfalls, heat stress, plant pests and diseases. If we did not succeed in making the necessary changes, the consequences could be really too awful to contemplate. What do you think we need to change right now? We need to put a price on carbon in markets. And to do that, we need to put a price on denial in politics. We put 110 million tons into the atmosphere every day as if it's an open sewer. We need to stop burning carbon fuels as quickly as possible. It's a big agenda. When you see an image of a glacier melting into the ocean, it's almost someone could look at that and think, well, what can I do to be part of a solution rather than a problem? I know I can't leave a room without turning off the lights. It's a very small gesture, but what would you suggest? What can we do to participate? Well, there are three kinds of things that everybody can do, and you've already mentioned the first one, be aware of what you do in your own life to contribute to the climate crisis and don't feel it as a constant oppressive burden of guilt, but just develop routines to conserve energy and extend that into your interactions in the marketplace so that when you buy goods and services, you express uh, a preference for the most environmentally responsible options available. Secondly, don't let climate denial stand unchallenged. When I was a boy in the South, the civil rights movement came out of a, a set of conversations that were won by advocates of justice and fairness, and then the law started to change. That's a real phenomena in democracy. But then third, be very aware of your role as a citizen in communicating with candidates for office who want your support and elected officials with whom you have the ability to communicate. And if you use a two-part message, it can make a difference. Part one, uh, Mr. or Ms. Candidate, if you do the right thing on climate, I'm going to help you. Uh, part two, if you do the wrong thing on climate, I promise you, I'm going to organize my friends and everybody I know and do everything I can to kick you out of office. What about overall, beyond uh, climate issues, beyond environmental concerns? We have multiple revolutions underway. Scientists are now able to cross the lines that divide species, phenomena that really give us a new leverage over uh, the blueprint of life itself. We're seeing an outgrowth as human civilization presses against the limits of some natural resources like groundwater and topsoil. Uh, we're seeing uh, the sixth great extinction uh, unfolding now, which threatens the web of life. And of course, we're seeing the climate crisis and along with it, a revolution in the way we produce energy and store energy and use energy. This is a period of change without any precedent, but we also face a challenge to the way our democracy functions. We have seen the hacking of democracy with the operating system in the U.S., our Constitution no longer serving its owners, but uh, co-opted through the means of big campaign contributions and lobbying and the influence of large concentrated wealth generally. You could look at the uh, history of democracy in America as a play in three acts. The, the initial period when the printing press was dominant it did empower individuals 
In the last third of the 20th century, television displaced print and installed gatekeepers that charged for access to the public square. Now, the internet is beginning to jostle with television in a way that disrupts our ability to harvest the wisdom of crowds and make good collective decisions. That has to be restored, and I'm optimistic that internet and social media-based forms of communication are bringing individuals back into the equation where they can use knowledge and the best available evidence as an alternative to wealth-dominating decision-making. And I hope reestablish our ability to start making good decisions again. So if we don't have this, this change, um, if we don't have this cultural shift, what happens? You know, our whole civilization uh, arose in a so-called envelope of conditions that emerged after the end of the last ice age, and we take them for granted. But the first cities didn't appear until after the last glacial retreat. Everything that we have built up in human civilization has been built up during that relatively uh, short period of time, 10,000 years or so and in a set of conditions that we're now putting at risk. So just as the proverbial uh, saying, a fish doesn't know it swims in water, we are not uh, constantly aware that we live in these conditions that we've always taken for granted. But if they are destroyed, if they disappear, then the consequences could be uh, quite serious indeed. But we're going to win this. This year in the U.S., three quarters of all the new electricity generating capacity is coming from solar and wind. And that trend is accelerating. We're seeing China putting a cap on its emissions. And India has just established a goal of 40% of its power from renewables. And in the U.S., President Obama is using his executive authority under an old law, the Clean Air Act, to sharply reduce CO2 emissions. But I think that we have the opportunity to develop a shared sense of mission that could really make all of the human story turn toward a much brighter outcome. What does the phrase beyond the horizon mean to you? Well, as the uh, head of the central bank in England said recently, we've always had uh, the tragedy of the commons, one way of defining the climate crisis is the tragedy of the horizon, meaning that we all share the atmosphere, but we also all see the horizon as a distant place, perhaps far enough away that we need not engage our attention with it directly and immediately. But the horizon is not that far away, and the sky above us is not as vast as it seems. It's a thin shell surrounding the planet. We need to pay attention to protecting it and in the process protecting the future of humankind.